Hey guys, it's Harrison alongside Josh, and this is the Awkward Sports Podcast. We're going to talk Tampa Bay Buccaneers football. They lost to the Atlanta Falcons 16-13 yesterday on a last-second field goal. Uh, defensive game for the most part, Josh. Yeah, I mean, basically what you were just talking about. I mean, both teams have phenomenal defenses, and they both showed up coming into this week. And obviously, one of these defenses was going to get the short end of the straw, the short end of the stick with the final outcome. And unfortunately for Bucks fans and for anyone who roots for Tampa Bay around the country, it was the Bucks that fell short um, against the Falcons on a game-winning field goal. Again, a game filled with turnovers. Antoine Winfield Jr. is spectacular. I just wanted to point that out. I mean, every, it seems like every okay, week. But yeah, of course he is. It was, is it, that goes without saying almost, doesn't it? So good. But like, you're right. It does go without saying, but putting those names out there, especially for, you know, because the Bucks don't get talked about a whole lot unless Brady is a part of it. And even we, then, it wasn't even the Bucks got talked about. It was still Tom Brady. It was. And like, just want to put that out there earlier on his career since, you know, Mike Evans on the other side of the ball, who also had a good game has been playing for the Bucs for about a decade now and, you know, never gets talked about either, along with Levante David. So I bring these names oh, up. Levante here. David gets absolutely zero. None zero. of the attention he deserves. Zero. At all. Zero. And I'm going to segue quickly here for a second because you, we talk about Levante David. And he was drafted in the same class as Bobby Wagner. They were both second-round picks. They were both a handful of draft picks apart. I think one was like 35th and the other was like uh, 39th. I mean, it was like that close. Both second round picks, both have a Super Bowl championship. And if you look at the numbers throughout their career, phenomenal. And they're pretty much identical. You know, one's got more praise than the other, but I just wanted to put that out there. That's why I bring up these names like Winfield, David Evans, because other people do not. Obviously, on here we do, but other people don't. Yeah. Obviously, we talk floor sports on this podcast. So the Tampa Bay Buccaneers will get plenty of attention, especially given that I'm from the Tampa Bay area and Josh here is from Orlando. Doesn't mean we won't talk Dolphins and Jags. Of course we will be. But today is about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah, it's – um. Did you? I saw a stat, too, that I don't know if you're aware of. The Bucks' home record this season, one and three. Man, it's like Florida – What is know. home field advantage? What is home I don't, field – We don't know what that is. I think what we need – as Bucks fans and as Gator fans, I think what we need is to just find a way to get whatever each team is doing and put it together because Florida on college can't win on the road and Tampa and the NFL can't win at home, but they're both good. If you have it where the Gators only have the one home, sorry, the one road win and the Bucks yeah. only have the one home win. Wait, who even is the home win? Let me double check this. Uh, you have it where I know they lost to the Eagles. I know they lost to the Lions. They lost. Oh, that's right. It's the Bears. The Bears, Bears week two. Yeah, the Bears. The uh, the bad news. The very bad news. Bears. Duh, um, bad news. Bears. And um, yeah, <laughs> I see what you did there. But um, obviously you look at the home games though. I will give them this. They did beat the Bears, which that's not anything to really brag about. But the other two still home, win. It is, but the other two home games outside of the Atlanta game. Which is why I'm kind of I've kind of been like, okay, the Bucks have been fine up to this point. Uh, is they lost to Detroit and they lost to Philly. Like, right. yeah, they were home games, but those are arguably the two best teams in the NFC. Uh, San they Francisco are, Florida. but also those were two games at home where they really weren't games. No, like, like the no. Eagles and the Lions both handled the lot handled the Bucks pretty well. And you and think in a did. home environment, and look, and I get it, Detroit fans really showed up for that Bucks game, especially. I would know I was in the building for that one. But you have to think, in an NFL game, if this was like college football and you just had it where, you know, top college team is playing mid-tier college team, okay, yeah, winning by two scores on the road is going to happen. But in the NFL – Having it where, well, the Bucs scored, I think, just 11 points against the Eagles at home and then couldn't even get a touchdown against the Lions, that's that's not good. Something needs to be figured out. And then, you, okay, and then you at least have the excuse going to the Falcons game, okay, those are the Eagles, those are the Lions, those are two of the top teams in the entire NFL. 
Then you go and you lose to one of the teams that would also be considered mid-tier. That's when you yeah. know something's wrong. No, it, it, it definitely is. I mean, and we can kind of pinpoint what that is, but branching off of that, it also comes with the expectation, right? Like, obviously, the offseason happened for Tampa Bay. Brady retired. What was going to be the plan at quarterback? They decided to go with Baker Mayfield. And obviously, you know, he 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 got hurt in the Detroit game. He tried to play through it. It didn't work. Credit to Detroit again, because like I said, those are two great teams. And even though Tampa didn't show up, I can still, with the changing of the guard at QB, because it's such an important position, I can live with those losses to teams that we might see either one of those teams in the Super Bowl, not just in the conference championship, along with maybe, like I said, San Francisco. But the Falcons game is one of those because it's a divisional game. And because you can't look at that side of the ball for Atlanta, their offense, and say that they have a far, a far superior quarterback than Tampa does. They got Desmond Ritter under center. That's the game they needed to win. And that's where, like, the problems – that's the first, to me at least, the first, you know, home game loss that wasn't really acceptable with where this team is at and where this team could be. The other games, obviously, fantastic opponents. But, Harrison, I have a question for you. Answer. Obviously, you saw I was I was I had eyes on like every single game yesterday. You obviously were more locked into this one, this Bucks Falcons game. There were obviously turnovers. I mean, what do you think was really the main problem that you saw from this Tampa Bay offense? Because obviously, you can look at the numbers. The defense obviously looked pretty good yesterday. Yeah, it's almost like you have to just look really, really deep. Both teams had unnecessary penalties both had nine the difference in yards is so inconsequential we're not even going to say okay this team was more undisciplined than the other when it came to this game it really did just come down to one team just had an extra opportunity to score in a third field goal that the other didn't and it just happened to be the falcons on the last play of the game because you could say oh yeah baker threw the pick and then the falcons uh, pass coverage was really good in that final play, and it gave him a chance to sack Baker. But also, Desmond Ritter lost the ball three times, and all three fumbles were recovered. So you really can't say that's where the Bucks lost the game, even if it technically did. One thing I am looking at is that running game. Oh yeah, this has not been able. Apart from the Bears game, it has not been able to get established at all this year. Uh. Your RB1 is Rashad White, and he is averaging 2.6 yards per carry. If you take yeah. away Baker, because remember, his rushing yards count for the rushing stats. Mm -hmm. You take away that 31-yard rush, which, fun fact, is his longest run since his rookie season. Heard that on television. Just want to throw that out there. It's fun fact. They're averaging about 2.4 yards per carry. Kashawn Vaughn, 1.8. If yeah. they were able to establish a run game at all, and I'm not in look, I'm not saying, and, and you can even see this. Look, if you look at the Falcons, they averaged more than four. Coral Patters Patterson had 5.6 yards per carry. And even if uh, Tyler, oh, geez, um, Algier, I'm uh, for yeah, some Tyler reason, Algier from Atlanta. Yeah, yeah, Tyler Algier. I don't know why I almost blanked on that name for some reason. I've had him fancy like for two years for some reason, not this year, but the last two years. And turns out surprising, a uh, good fantasy pick. I just want to point yeah, that out. I have him too. I actually have him too. Stash. Really? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, I think your point is pretty spot on. The running game hasn't been there and it really hasn't been there for a couple of years. You know, obviously you go back to the Super Bowl year, their offensive line was phenomenal at almost every, at almost every position and they were running healthy the too. It was healthy, and, and and Fournette was obviously doing a fantastic job. We saw the big time uh, Super Bowl run that he had for the touchdown. I mean, and that was kind of really defined. I mean, playoff Lenny, Super Bowl Lenny, Lombardi Lenny, all the nicknames that were thrown at him because he turned it up in the playoffs. Obviously, the past few years, the running game hasn't been that for Tampa. Part of it could be the personnel. You know, part of it could be Rashad White and Keyshawn Vaughn. Are those guys really the answers at that position? But also part of it is the O-line is kind of in a transition phase. They had a guard retired. They have Jensen, who's their center, who's not really that healthy. He's missing games. And then you have a changing of the guard and offensive coordinator. So all of these different things, including personnel, factor in to what has been a struggling Bucks running game. And, you know, you look at Atlanta. 
obviously nobody saw what was going to, I mean, B. John Robinson barely played. I mean, nobody knew this until like the game happened. It was like the best kept secret out there. No, it's just like, you look up, um, where is he? <laughs> yeah. He's just not out there, but, um, in, you know, that's just something that, and again, like back to the Tampa running game, like it's been a problem that, yeah, you mentioned the Baker run. I mean, Rashad white had 13 carries for 34 yards. That's just not good enough. No. And, and, um, and, and even then, let me say this. Yeah. Let's say even if they're averaging two, like 2.4 yards, Let's say they had a couple situations where they got what they they got the job done, say in the red zone. Um, but one of those runs was Rashad White finding the end zone. You know, he ha- I would be able to say, okay, there's at least that. There is somewhere that this running game is able to accomplish something. But they weren't doing anything. And if they were able to establish any kind of run game at all. They win this game. You could argue maybe they could have been in Detroit because they've been able to move the ball down the field at all. Yeah, and I mean, there's another team in Florida that, you know, has what most people would consider role player type running backs. That's actually running the ball and creating uh, creating plays that help the run game really well. And that's the Miami Dolphins. You know, you look at yeah. Devon Hansen, and you look at Raheem Mostert. You know, these guys were, you know, uh, at one point, Ed Shane came out of AM. Mostert came from San Francisco. These guys um, hadn't have not been looked at as like the workhorses of the league, like a Nick Chubb or Jonathan Taylor. They never have. I mean, Mostert was still seen as a very solid running back in San Francisco, which is why when he went to Miami, everyone was thought that was a really good pickup. Exactly. He followed me. Yeah. Not that. And also not that Mostert played that well last night on Sunday night football. He, I mentioned in my, uh, in one of my recap videos that he had negative yards for most of the first half. Yeah, he still found a way to manage himself and get back to five yards on average per carry. Imagine yeah. what his stats on that could have been if he'd been able to get going sooner. Like you know what he's capable of. Yeah, and that was a down game for them as well. And I think we go back to the Tampa right, and they just haven't been able to get the run game going. And I feel like be, when you are in the position that Tampa is in, with as far as quarterbacks, you know Baker Mayfield can. There's things he can do, and there's things that he can't. There's limitations there, regardless of what people might think. He's not the Justin Herbert, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow, Trevor Lawrence type quarterback where he fixes your mess. You have to build around him and you have to give him pieces right. to elevate him. He's not going to necessarily elevate an offensive roster. You he have to- someone that can elevate along yeah. with you. Exactly. Exactly. And that's something yeah. that, um, if the running I don't want to necessarily discredit Baker by saying you have to elevate him. I think it's more fitting to say he will elevate with you. Like he will step up if you put the guys around him who will step up with him. Yeah, it's and there's certain and there's certain quarterbacks that are like that, and then there's certain quarterbacks that we talk about as the best of the best who don't have don't have to be in that kind of situation. But he's one of those guys that is, and it's just one of those things where you do have to build around him. And obviously, Tampa's run game hasn't been great. But again, we've you know talked about the box 16-13. We can only talk about that one matchup so long. We kind of covered the gist. I just want one more thing about Baker. I just don't want anyone to say that it's like his fault that they lost yesterday. Because I thought he actually had a better performance than Desmond Ritter. He's yeah. actually played some solid football for the Bucks so far. Yeah. And I came into this season saying Trask will be the starter by week three or four. I was very <laughs> wrong. And now I'm at the point where I'm defending Baker Mayfield. Yeah, I know. That's what how about, well he's played this year. If he even had played this decently on other teams, he would probably have stayed the starter. I'm not saying the Browns would have kept him, but I think he at least would have been uh he would still be on Carolina. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, you know, he struggled in 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 past teams. But again, Tampa's also they had com- they had compiled together a roster of players. That was uh, that was set up to compete for championships because they brought in Tom Brady. So they they drafted really well in 2020. They got worse on the offensive line. You know, obviously they have these playmakers at wide receiver uh, and Mike Evans and Chris Godwin that maybe Baker didn't necessarily have in Carolina or didn't have in Cleveland. And when you have those players, you do expect a better performance from from a quarterback like him. And we've kind of seen what he's capable of. And at the same time. That may not like the loss might not have been his fault, but sometimes in close games, 
it's on you as the quarterback. Maybe not, it's not your fault that they lost, but you might have to be the reason from time to time that, that you can win. pull out a win like that. And right. ultimately that didn't happen. And it, it looked like for a moment they could have. Once again, especially when he had that 31 yard run, you thought they were in a great position at a touchdown. It just didn't happen. Yeah, I got to finish. But you have a great game. point there. You, yeah. He's not the reason they are losing, but he also isn't necessarily the reason they're pulling out wins. One, because they aren't, and two, because, you know, he, he just hasn't been. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly it. And, I mean, that pretty much sums up that game. I mean, 16-13, to 13, that's a tough way to lose, especially a division game, because you win that, you have firm control of the division, and now, you know, you lose that game. You still can kind of control your destiny down the stretch of the season, but – you know, with the Bills, you know, still on the schedule. You have to play Atlanta again, um, and, and this time it's not going to be at home, which maybe for in Tampa's sake is good. But, you know, regardless, there's still a long way to go. On the college side of things, uh, obviously the big game for Florida coming up is this week. Uh, the Florida, Michigan, Georgia. Largest outdoor cocktail party. And – I know we didn't talk much about this, but Harrison, I want your like brief thoughts on what you think, you know, a week away, what are we looking at Florida, Georgia? What's the expectation here as a Gator? What should we expect? What should we expect? Not what should we hope for? What should we expect? I mean, are we just going to go see the Florida Gators go lose to the number one team in the country? It's something what, and, like when you're asking, what do I expect? What do you, oh, you know? I expect them to just go pull off the upset of the century. They'll put up 60 against Georgia. They'll sack whoever is the new quarterback this week, six or seven times. You know, maybe if you're playing uh NCAA 14 on easy mode, maybe you do it. Maybe you do pull that off. Which maybe, which maybe some will do, which maybe some will do out of rage after the outcome of the game. No, I mean that won't. I don't know how that makes people feel better. It wouldn't make me feel better. I, I, it's a video I, game. I, I've personally never done it, but I've seen those videos on social media. But like, I will say this: I, I don't, I don't know what Florida is going to be able to do against a, a, a team like Georgia. They're just so fantastic. But I will say this: Georgia has, as far as like, they are really, really laden with injuries bowers is out yeah and no that's that's the biggest problem but i don't but but even then, like they it's not like there wasn't a qb battle at the beginning of the season i think georgia will have a quarterback that will have a solid performance and even the week before they proved they could play a full 60 minutes when they absolutely annihilated kentucky oh yeah i mean they put it to kentucky but one thing that we've seen in the sec right i mean you know, just because we see one team look a certain way against one team, sometimes it can be matchups. And it's really it's really strange how right. that always seems to unfold in this conference. And not only Bowers is out, but a number of Georgia's top defensive players are out. So it's not like we're getting their top roster. Now, do I think does this means Florida's going to win this game? Probably not. But, but I even do when you but you remember, this is a very deep Georgia team. It's, you it's don't fair. have their top guys. But a lot of these, you know, backups are starters on a lot of other high quality programs. They are. And that's why I still think that, you know, Georgia is going to come away with the win. But I don't think all hope is lost as like you go back into last year's upcoming game with Florida, Georgia, like. That game going into it, there was just there was just no no chance with all the talent that they had. I mean, now we had that were... false hope at the beginning of the well, Florida fans had that false hope at the beginning of the third quarter. Yeah, they were getting pounded, and then they found a way to come back. I think the big key, and I think Napier is going to preach it all week, is to get off to a fast start against these guys. Like, let's right. see what they can do in the first five minutes of the game. If they can, you know, maybe get a stop on defense and go down and score one touchdown and then go from there and see what uh, see what the game unfolds like after that. Because, you know, Georgia also is one of those teams that is pretty – they always have the lead, it seems like. Now, this season, they have been playing from behind and they've been able to come back from behind. I think Georgia will probably win this game, but – there are things I think Florida can do to make this game a little bit more stressful for them than it, than it has been in years past. So it'll be very interesting to see how that game unfolds. So can you see this being like an Auburn game where like Georgia pulls out like a closer win towards the end? 
or do you still see as being where they still win? They they cover the spread. I think I think uh, I think it could be closer, like the Auburn game, right? I don't think I I have to see the line. I don't know what the spread it's, is. Uh, minus fourteen and a half. Minus fourteen. I think Florida has a chance of covering that spread. I I think they could this year. Um, I think that. Uh, again, it's all going to be set upon how they start the game, though. If they start the game down seven nothing, good luck because you're already now. Georgia's kind the of mindset struggling. is you're behind. Exactly. Like, like if you if if Georgia gets out seven nothing, the game's done as far as I'm concerned because I feel like the only way you have a shot against that team is you they come into the game maybe with a little bit of jitters and you kind of give them a reason to get play it safe, get conservative. Oh, we're down now. We gotta you know they're reeling a little bit if they get out and they score instantaneously and they get a stop or a turnover they're going to be settled in and they're going to be cruising the rest of the way right so it's going to be all dependent on how the game starts that's how i think that game's going to go now obviously for the florida fans out there we all know that coming up they are going to debut a new uniform it's a it's a all black uniform look Never in University of Florida history have we seen anything like this. Um, we have seen concepts of it in the past, you know, people talking about it. Some people are for it. Some people may not be as excited about it. But it was announced that it was going to be the Arkansas game, and it was announced long before the season started. And now that game has been officially announced at a set time of noon. All right, Harrison, what are your thoughts? I mean – I think it was inevitable that some game was going to be a noon game this year. If you had told me that it was going to be Florida, Arkansas, I probably wouldn't have believed it, especially because it's been a night game in the last few years. I know Florida was good, like much better than they were competing for the college football playoff in 2020, but Vanderbilt was a four o'clock game. Charlotte and McNeese State were night games. I don't know how this ended up being the day game. It's 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 crazy when you think about it. And, and look, and it'll be like twenty percent cooler than it would have been if you had played Charlotte at noon. But Charlotte or McNeese State, those are noon games. There was no, and honestly. Florida might have won by a larger margin had it been a noon game because then you're in the swamp when it's like 95 degrees, sun is in your face. We, I've been on the field covering Florida football games for noon games. If you do not wear a hat in some kind, like if you do the t-shirt and shorts, you're going to cook. I don't care how much sunblock you put on. The only way you avoid sun. A burn is wearing layers in 95 degrees. It's why I'm conditioned to wear sleeves in Florida. I'm wearing sleeves now to prove my points. But I I don't get it. And then they're going to be wearing all black. Uh, They're going to be wearing all black, right? And like... I don't think they did because they looked in and said, ooh, Florida's wearing all black. What's No, that's not why they did. They don't care, truthfully. I think part of it is Arkansas is uh, two and five, two and six. Yeah, they're two and six. Yeah, you have a Florida team that's expected to lose this week and will be five and three. They'll yeah. be three and two in conference play up against a team that is going to have a losing record. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you look at the game and it's like it's like I said earlier, it's one of those things where it's like, does this game deserve the noon slot? Yeah, it I deserves could've... It slot. deserves it, but I also could have seen it being like, you know, a four o'clock game on the SEC network. Right. I like, totally like... could have or maybe maybe even SEC Network Plus. Like, I, I I think it also has to do with the fact that you put it on at noon. What channel is this game going to be on? I just want to double check just to make sure. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, what network is going to be on? I imagine it's probably going to be SEC Network for, for the new stuff, but it'll be interesting. Yeah, it's actually, I don't even think it says it anywhere yet. It doesn't, but um, it's one of those things where it's like, we found out it's noon. Does this game deserve the noon slot? It absolutely deserves it. But did they also know for over a year that Florida was going to be wearing black this week? And that it, I don't, I don't care think it was a factor there. in that like, decision. It's not. No, it's not. It wasn't a factor in the decision. It was more just like, like, come on. Like, it's definitely, come on, man. Like, come on, man. Like, it's one of those things where it's like, like, everyone, like, you know, it's been about a year we've been advertising this. 
and it's I know it's November, but guess what? It's still hot in Florida in November. It doesn't get. It won't be as hot though. It we won't. Both lived in, we both live. It can, I mean, like it can be, but like we have lived in Gainesville in November. But it, a noon game will be like eighty, maybe eighty-five, and that—that's a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah Actually, there are times in November where it can just be seventy degrees. Yeah, it's a wild. I love 